Hey everyone, we're back with the second episode of HLTV Confirmed, the new show from all of us here at the home of competitive Counter-Strike. This episode will focus mostly on the new MIBR team made in Brazil. As you probably know, the Immortals organization acquired the name and also the players of the former SK roster Fallen, called Sarah, Fair and the guys. It was revealed at a big ticketed event in Sao Paulo last Saturday and we'll be talking to the players and looking at the history of uh, the brand in this episode. Let's take a look at what segments we actually have for you. First up, we have an interview with Fallen and Coursera of the new MIBR team, former SK. We asked them what they feel about the move, how it came about and what they think it can mean for them and the Brazilian scene. Next up, we'll try to take a look at why it actually matters so much, not only for Brazilians, but also for the entire CS scene. What's really the legacy of MIBR and why does this mean so much? We'll also be hearing from two other legendary 1.6 players, Sonic and Abe, the two Danes who are currently coaching Astralis and North. We'll let them talk a little bit about how it felt to meet Mibber back in the day and how they feel about the name being back in the scene. To round things off, we'll have a preview of next week's ESL 1 Cologne. Finally, we have all the big teams gathered in one of the more storied and legendary events in CS history. But first off, let's talk to Fallen and Colzera about the Brazilians reviving the old MIPR team. Enjoy it. Basically, when our contracts were about to expire with SK, we started looking for uh, options. And we follow the boats transfer when we had to get in he was playing for Immortals with the fact that we have been witnessing the way Noah has been working with the other Brazilian players in Immortals and we always knew that he's a guy that's working close to where we live because he's from Los Angeles as well. This kind of opened up a precedent where we could talk uh, a little bit more freely about stuff we wanted to do and we started looking for another organization as well. We heard proposals from a lot of people and Noah came with something that was interesting for us. And the idea to join my BR was actually an idea from ourselves. Like he told us that my Immortals was going for a way of working where they didn't want Immortals to represent everything they have. So like in, in Overwatch they have the Valiant brand and for Counter-Strike he even said that we can create something else. And then when you ask Brazilians which brand they want to create, you can always say, hey, my BR is the coolest name we always had in Brazil. And for Counter-Strike it makes sense. So after going for all those purples and, and what we're going to do and stuff like that with Noah and other people. We just realized that Noah was a good option for us and then we set up that we might revive MyBR and then we started assuming stuff from there. Joining MyBR is a great experience for us and for me personally because I saw every MyBR team playing. Sometimes I was just a young guy playing Counter-Strike and I was watching them playing outside Brazil and later I was able to play against them, lose a couple of tournaments for them. And I never joined in. I never joined my BR forces because in 2009 I was their biggest rival, a player for Fire Gamers. And after that, my BR kind of started shutting down their activities. And so reviving this organization is a great experience. It brings down, and for every Brazilian fan, it's a huge brand. Like every Brazilian fan knows Counter Strike, they know my BR. They knew all the history they made in Counter Strike in Brazil. And for us to be able to revive all this and maybe build another piece of history and put our my BR back at the top again. It's going to be insane for every single Brazilian fan. MIBR is, uh, is uh, in the past. There is one of the is is the most the most successful Brazilian Brazilian organization. So be there for us. People start to going to start to respect more us, and we can we can try to show up more. We 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 can try to show up more than we do now. And for us, of course, we're going to have a big impact on our game style and your game and going to be more confident for representing the, the them tech so good. I think the fact that we joined MyBR might change the, the way and help improve even more the Brazilian scene because it's a, even if it's being organized by Americans like the My Mortals brand itself, 100% uh, Brazilian brand is going to help things get even better in Brazil. I think it's going to bring attention for brands that might not be interested in the past in Counter-Strike and because of having a Brazilian brand and stuff like that it could help bring their attention. So yes, I think it can help us develop into more of the scene. Of course, for us, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be a little bit pressure because everyone wa want us winning with that name tag. But 
we always have pressure. So for us, it doesn't matter if we represent uh, Nimtech from Brazil or Nimtech from Germany. So we're going to do our best. And I hope we're going to be the best team in the world again with that Nimtech. Uh, the pressure to perform is always there. It's a pressure that is inside us. We know that we have what it takes to be on the top. We have been there in the past and we want to be there again. So the pressure is always there. But it's a, it's a good pressure, it's not this kind of pressure that's going to bring us down, it's the pressure that's going to hype us to practice more and, and stay with the heads up when things are not going the way we want. We want. So I don't think the brand itself is going to bring any more pressure. But you know, Brazilian fans are very passionate, so yes, they, they will pressure us to be at the top of my VR and it's our job to do our best to stay there. I think joining a new brand is always a motivation because you want to show them that what are capable of, right? Not only the organization, but ourselves and all the fans. So you want to kind of create a new history, and, and it's a, it's like to start a new set go. So you 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 kind of starting fresh. So it always a uh, hype up, and it was the same for us when we joined OG. It was the same when we joined SK. We even won the Cologne tournament, and especially this time when the the first tournament for us is going to be Cologne, where we also made the first tournament for SK and we won there. So it's going to be a great feeling and we of course want to win this tournament and I think we can do that, we just need to play a little bit better than what have been playing. Okay, I think it's fair to say that certainly Fallen and Coursera are looking forward to playing on the MIBR and that there are some Brazilian fans who are probably also looking forward to them wearing the jerseys. But, but why? I mean, I think it's time we take a look back and try to discover why MIBR is such a big brand, what they really did and why they had an impact on CS in general. To help with that, I talked to HLTV.org's news editor Luis Mira about the brand's history. So Luis, uh, you've been looking at the MIBR and the whole uh, reveal thing and uh, the former SK roster going there for a while now. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about why this is such a big thing. Uh, the players obviously uh, know what MIBR is and are excited to play under that mm -hmm. name tag because it has history. But I think we need to maybe understand a little bit better what is that history and why is it such a big deal in, in, in Brazil? Um, why is it so important? Even though MIBR was not the most successful team in the history of Counter-Strike, you know, they had like a good two years, for example, 2006 and 2007, they they changed the perception of Brazilian esports, you know, because people actually started looking at Brazilian esports and started thinking, okay, this, this country has a huge talent pool, you know. And uh, in the interview that I did recently with Nack, uh, he said, we change it the way that people look at us because um, people, even Brazilian play, play players, started thinking we can actually win things, you know. Because at the time, the, the Brazilian internet was uh, crappy, you know. Uh, they had to play. They had to play online because uh, the internet was so bad that they had no conditions to play online, you know. So this is the kind of struggle that the Brazilian players faced on a daily basis, you know. So it was very hard to try to go and reach the next level. So by winning the tournament, it was a, one of the biggest tournaments uh, in the world at the time, yes, they will see. Uh, it was not only a huge achievement in itself, but it also changed the way that people looked at Brazilian esports, not just in Counter-Strike, but also in other esports games. Uh, they, they, they went on to win uh, some other tournaments, for example, DreamHack Winter the next year, SHG Open also in Denmark, uh, but the most important thing was that uh, they created in the Brazilian in the Brazilian scene a sense of we can actually win things, we can actually become a top contender. So it's not really about the number of titles that they achieved, which is not that great, you know. If you look, if you compare them to other teams, SK Fnatic, for example, or uh, Team 3D or something like that. But uh, it was actually a huge milestone because they changed the way that people uh, looked at Brazilian esports, not just in Counter Strike, but also in other games. So when when the models today, uh, with uh, Noah Winston at the helm and also Lopez uh, up there, when they say, or when they they say they want to capitalize on this and use it, it's it's not just fluff. <laughs> There's actually yeah. some history to go on there. How do yeah, you see definitely. that? Well, because definitely. Because that's also a big part of it. Uh, of this is definitely the business side. Uh, uh, we, we talked to them about that too, uh, trying to, 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 to make something new out of something really huge. Uh, but, but do you think that, that there's something to be had there, to be found? Yeah, I think so. It was also a very uh, 
popular brand, you know, uh, MIBR as a name was very uh, iconic. It was very popular because they, they helped to develop so many players. For example, Fallen, he didn't play for MIBR, but uh, he was then part of the team that from some of the players who actually left MIBR, joined Fire Gamers and they joined Complexity. MIBR, they helped nurture a lot of talent, you know, and you have still a lot of players who went through MIBR and are still playing today. For example, Bit, uh, NAC, FNX, you know, it was like, phone is, is pretty much the exception because every top player in Brazil had to play for MIBR at some point, you know. I think uh, the underdog story is one of the best things in sports, you know, and the MIBI was, were, were without a doubt, one of the, the biggest underdogs, you know, because they, they had, like, terrible conditions to play and to practice, and they overcame all those hurdles, you know, over time, and they s slowly became a top team, and, uh, and MIBR played a huge part in that. Uh, this underdog story is one of the biggest reasons why MIBR is such a popular name uh, in the fans. And it's funny because I, I guess it kind of fits pretty well with how Fallen has been uh, a spearheading figure in the community since then. <laughs> with yeah, his own yeah. Games Academy and what he really means for the Definitely. community. So it's, yeah. maybe it's a match right there. Of, of the yeah, and they also had their own underdog story. You know, when Before they started competing on international level, they didn't have any support. So they, they also asked for the community to help them, you know, they, they started a, a fundraising project to be actually, to actually be able to compete abroad. They had some issues attending the MLG X Aspen tournament. So they themselves were a struggling, a struggling team at some point, you know, so they can identify with that story. And uh, Fallen started his own Games Academy project, which has helped to develop a lot of top players as well. So I think this um this idea that is very popular in the Brazilian in the Brazilian scene to help uh to overcome these obstacles together you know as one I think that's that's a very cool story and that's something that really connects with the with the whole MIBR history and the fans too I guess because it's it's such a classic throughout all sports from Brazil yeah. it's a very classic story the the poor kid who overcomes troubles to uh, to become an international star, right? I mean, it's, yeah. I guess that's kind of a storyline that fits really with the whole with the whole nationality. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but but that's one thing then uh, the business side, the history, the legacy, and the fitting. But but then comes the actual CS to be played. <laughs> We're going to see them just in a couple of days, and they're going uh, to try to take on uh, Cologne, where they won when they changed to SK. Um, mm -hmm. So they have quite the test there. I mean. How do you see that? Uh, do you think it'll be a while before they're actually going to be showing up, or is this what's going to take them up from kind of the slump they've been in? Uh, I think it will help them to get some motivation, but I think that the problems uh, run a little bit deeper than than just that. You know, of course they've had some issues with SK; they are public, and players have addressed them. Uh, but I think it's not just about that, you know, I, I think it is also a little bit about underperformance. I think the biggest issue right now is Fur. He has not been playing at, a, at his usual level, nowhere like that. Uh, and I think he definitely needs to step up. It was, for me, the biggest reason why uh, SK were so, so, so successful last year. They had that dominant period uh, in the summer. Um, Fur is an amazing player. I think he was voted third or fourth player of the year. Um, not voted, but named um, by HLTV. Um, and if you look at his numbers, they're just uh, really below average, you know, his own average. So I think the and phone himself said that in an interview that I did with him that uh, Fer, Fer and I, uh, and I'm quoting him, Fer and I need to step up and play at our stellar, stellar level from 2017, 2016. So, so it's not like they, they themselves think that this is going to be the one and only thing to drive them back. I to think them. They, they, they realize that it's going to take a while before they are a, a, top, team, a top, top three team, for example. Uh, they, have, they have underperformed uh, on the individual level and then they had the whole issue with the communication. Uh, phone said that he he thought that things would be a little bit easier, you know, trying to adapt to a new language and a new communication system. Uh, now they, they seem to be getting uh, that uh, 
uh, fixed, but uh, now they need to look at their own uh, personal level, you know, and Fur, Fur has not been playing at, the, at his usual level, so I think um, if they keep like, if they stay like this, uh, I think that eventually we'll have a roster change and I see Bolt leaving the team. Well, he was already on the chopping block when they were considering Simple and uh, Flamey. And I think that if things do not do not improve, I think it will be just a matter of time before they actually replace one player. Um, but uh, I think right now the main, the biggest issue is Fur getting back to his level because he's like a huge part in the team's uh, play. And I think that uh, he needs to step up, definitely. Good. Okay, Luis, thank you for taking a little trip back in time <laughs> from all the research that you've done. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me. See you. Yeah, let's hope that Fallen and his men can bring back some of that old Brazilian legacy. To talk a little bit more about what it was like than actually meeting MIBR back in the 1.6 days, we have two other Counter-Strike legends for you. Sonic and Ave, who are now coaching Astralis and North, agreed to talk to me about what it was like playing against MIBR and how they feel about the name being back. It was always good games against uh, those guys. I respected them a lot. They played a huge amount of hours and they were really good to practice against. Also, when they showed up in good format tournaments, they were so hard to play. They uh, were shooting really well. It was tough, uh, pretty much. They uh, they remind me a little bit about FaZe today. They were extremely good individually uh, and they probably have had one of the best Aubers in the world or in the history of Counter-Strike in, in, in Kogu. It was extremely tough to uh, to play against them. They always uh, came up with something new and, and was playing extremely fast as well. I remember that that me and Ave were spending a lot of hours uh, trying to figure out how we should uh, would stop Kogo pretty much. And so it, it was uh, it was always tough matches, but but if I remember correctly, I, I think that we won the, the majority of, of our clash up against them. But uh, always a tough opponent, uh, always a great team, very hardworking and dedicated uh, as well. So it's it's really nice for for me uh, personally to to see that brand back. I can't remember all the names actually. We kind of joked that uh, every time they would change a the player, they would uh, kick somebody with a three-letter name and you would just take another three-letter name in. <laughs> Nostalgic uh, moment, pretty much. I always love to see uh, old, uh, old brands or teams, players, whatever, come back to the scene. It reminds me of, of some of the good times I had with Counter-Strike and, and in, even though that they were our enemies back then, uh, we, we still had a lot of fun. Uh, outside of the servers. It's gonna be cool to see just like the clan tag showing up in game. It's uh, nice to see and I think they, a lot of the players on the new team uh, are worthy to keep on uh, going with this legacy and um, I look forward to it. They are always a tough team to play against. Uh, they have some insanely good players and, and we always have our, our work cut out for us when we play against uh, uh, now MIBR. So it's going to be tough and, and I'm pretty sure that they will they will get a boost out of, of coming out onto to this team. We should not, even though that we are doing quite well at the moment, we should never underestimate the, a team like that. All right, so that trip back in time to the jolly old 1.6 days concludes our segments about MIBR for this episode. In just two days, action will kick off at ESL1 Cologne, one of the biggest and most storied CS events. And I think there are a lot of fans, myself included, that have been waiting for some quality Counter-Strike. It's been two weeks since Belo Horizonte and most of us are pretty anxious to see who's gonna win because we finally have all the biggest teams gathered again. Now far be it from me to actually analyze who's gonna go far and what the storylines are. Luckily, I have help. And going to Cologne to do coverage for HLTV is our very own seasoned writer, Professor. Prof, how are you doing? Uh, great. What are you gonna be looking out for in Cologne? It's been a few weeks since there was a tournament and uh, I mean, all the top teams are gonna be there. So what's, what are the storylines gonna be? Yeah, I mean that is the biggest storyline, I guess. It's it's the biggest tournament before the before the player break. So 16 team tournament. It's, it's part of the Intel Grand Slam. Uh, all of the top teams are there. Like the top six teams are all there, and that makes it a, a great tournament. And of, of course, the history that Cologne has is is kind of big. It's a massive tournament in terms of uh, like the, the fans and people coming to watch. Yeah, I mean, they call it the Cathedral of Counter-Strike, I guess. What's really the, what's the history there? I mean, what, why is it so important, the city? Yeah, I've, I've only been there last year. That was my first time, I must say. 
but uh, the atmosphere there is definitely something something else comparing to any other esport event mostly you get the the crowd like very hyped for for the local team maybe a few other like m mega favorites but in cologne i think that every team gets a gets a fair share of that like energy the hype of the crowd like every match is very very exciting to watch so you mentioned the top teams are going to be the obviously we have uh, we haven't seen navi and astralis and face in the same tournament since i guess marseille Uh, what's, what do you think that's going to be like? I mean, Astralis walked over everyone in ECS and Navi had a few to little problems in China recently. What do you think it's going to be like? Yeah, I mean, Astralis is definitely the, the heavy favorite going into it. I think we didn't have such a dominant team in the way they win tournaments for, for a very, very long time. I guess uh, SK was able to win a, a bunch of tournaments in a row last year, but not like this big tournaments like as big as Astralis won and of course uh, the way they won uh, Astralis that is the, it was pretty dominant all the time so that's something that makes them the the favorite definitely for this tournament but on the other hand uh, we have Navi that haven't been been placing below top four since they added electronic that's a pretty impressive run for like over six months now So they're with simple, of course, uh, pretty pretty exciting team to watch. And then phase uh, phase with a stand-in thing, it's kind of kind of interesting for them. But uh, you don't know what to expect. But they still are able to to pick up tournaments, pick up trophies. Yeah, I mean, uh, you have three tournament winners from the three previous ones. Those three teams you're mentioning right now. Uh, but who do you think is going to come out on top in all of this? I mean, can 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 Navi with Simple and Face uh, as a well-playing team, even with standings, really threaten them? I'm of course they they can threaten uh, Astralis, but it's hard to see. It's hard, hard to make an argument that they will. That's kind of my uh, my view on it. Of course, Simple has been playing insane for the for, for the whole year and. It can happen that he takes down Astralis just by, by himself, but we saw those matchups earlier in the year and it didn't go that way. So it's hard to make an argument that it will happen this time. And of course, it can happen and be exciting to watch what will go on in those matches if they happen in, at the tournament. Let's dive a little bit into to the phase thing. I mean, we obviously at this point don't know who they're going to bring, but it seems like Chroman is a pretty pretty good fit and he's been playing with them for for a few uh, tournaments now. Uh, also winning in Belo Horizonte. I mean, uh, what will it take for them, do you think, to, to, to go all the way? Because uh, obviously, uh, I mean, a position this time is going to be a little tougher. Uh, the stand-in thing, it kind of, it, it's different when you go into a tournament with a stand-in and it's different for other teams to play against you when you have a stand-in. So that that's kind of like a shroud thing, a kind of a mist on, on you, how, you, how you're actually going to play. A lot of people don't know. That's what people have been saying in interviews when uh, at Belo Horizonte and tournaments before that kind of makes it uncertain how they're going to play. Uh, their phase actually was playing pretty simple. That's how they like to play. And of course, with a stand in, that's the best way you can play. But now they're all this is if they go with Chroman, it will be their third tournament in a row playing with him. And I think that gives other teams a lot of a lot of uh, demos to go on to kind of figure out how they like to play. Uh, what they would need to do to get, to win, actually, I guess there's about two weeks between between Belo Horizonte and, and Cologne, so they'll have to add some, something new and uh, kind of elevate their game to a to a higher level to to be able to win there, I guess. So that's it for maybe the top teams. Let's say the top three ones that we we can see going the distance. Like what what if we go just uh, just a little little bit below that? Who do you see as interesting teams uh, in the next year? Two other teams that I think uh, will be exciting to watch at TSL1 Cologne are uh, Mouse Sports and, and Liquid. I, uh, yeah, after ESL1 Belo Horizonte, I feel like they were both at kind of a similar place, even though they had different results. Uh, I feel like both teams were uh, just overplayed. They played so many events in a short span of time, and uh, that took a toll on them. I think you could see that. On, especially on maps that they used used to be pretty good on, uh, teams started figuring them out. They their map pool kind of started started looking shaky. 
I think uh, for both teams, actually, Mirage is a, is a good map to, to pick out uh, for Mousepurse, especially that, that would used to be a staple for them. And recently, they couldn't really get the wins you would expect them to. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Mouseports went uh, for an unexpected roster change, bringing in Snacks for Sticko. So it's obviously a, not a like for like uh, change. They're replacing a fully support player that is Sticko for Snacks, who we know from the past can be a superstar player. I think even though they can maybe play similar positions or maybe even the same positions on some maps, uh, Sticko and Snacks definitely won't be playing and won't be playing them in the same way. So I think Snacks will take some space off of some other Mouseport players, and that will just kind of change the whole dynamic of Mouseports, uh, which will be interesting to see how it develops in, in Cologne. Cloud9, now that they have uh, Sticko in the in the squad, also a pretty interesting pickup, I guess, even though it's just a stand-in for now. Uh, as I mentioned before, he's he's a player that is just a total, total support player. He'll do anything that needs to be done for the squad, uh, and I think that would be good for the for the main trio of Cloud9 as uh, Rush, Automatic, and Tarek. They'll have all the freedom they need to do like whatever they feel like doing on the map, and I think that will definitely help them. But we'll see how how it develops as a full squad. Obviously, they didn't have a lot of time to practice together, so we can't really expect some too deep strategies or stuff like that, just maybe some basic counter strike and if the chemistry is good, they could potentially have a, like a solid run. Okay, so um, when you look at the, what's the centerpiece of this whole episode, uh, the new MIBR team, I think it's, it's probably good that we also talk about uh, their uh, coming into Cologne because now they have a couple of weeks off and in the meantime they've had a huge party in Sao Paulo the other week and, uh, and, now, and now underneath uh, under uh, uh, Immortals and the MIBR brand. Uh, I mean, changing orgs might not be the key to most uh, things, even though, though that Fallen says that, that uh, every, every time, time they, they did, did they, they, they were always, always, always a little bit, bit more hacked up. up. How do you see them coming into Cologne? Yeah, uh, uh, as you said, like changing orgs isn't something you kind of focus around when you're talking about like the CS being played at, on the server itself. But I think for these guys, they had some friction with the with SK in the last couple of months, at least from reports and stuff like that coming out. So I think moving to MIBR, especially like the history of that brand that, that it has, will be a positive for these guys and kind of maybe hype them up and get them get them like fully focused for for Cologne and to perform at the at the first event under the new organization in the New Jerseys. So I think that will give them a, a kind of a plus, and also they have some time off. Obviously, <coughs> obviously the uh, the promotional thing kind of took took some time, but still from Belo Horizonte to to Cologne, they have some time to practice to get some uh, new stuff in, and uh, the more time they spend with with Stewie, the communication will get better, and all that combined makes them kind of a dark horse for for Cologne in my eyes. And we also saw that uh, I think Cole Serra said in an interview that. Fallen's going back to IGLing, so I guess it'll be the classic style of SKLG, uh, whatever they're they're called. Yeah, the the I guess the roles are back to normal, so no more Colzera calling on one map, Stewie calling on two other maps and stuff like that. So it's back to the Godfather of Brazilian CS, Fallen leading the troops. Colzera is uh, through all of that has been fragging pretty well. Nothing really changed in that department, at least, but. Having the role fallen back, back leading the troops, that's like a positive sign in my eyes, at least, that things are going the right direction for, for the Brazilians. Okay, so that's it for our Cologne preview. Thank you, Prof, and uh, I guess safe travels to Germany. Thank you. That's it for the second episode of HLTV Confirmed. Thanks so much for watching. Remember to leave your feedback for us so we can do even better in the show. I hope you enjoyed watching. I'll see you next time.